Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope, can I get some nods if you all can hear me just fine? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, my name is Nisa Page Lieberman, and along with Jane Sachs, my friend and colleague, we founded Monuments to Movements in the House of Radical Feminist Practices um, about a year ago. And today we are delighted to welcome you to our second Let's Speak Easy conversation series that is centered around our partnership with the Nas National Domestic Workers Alliance and our initiative Monument to Human Infrastructure. So today we welcome June Barrett and Christina Mevs Apgar from NDWA with additional video contributions from NDWA founder and director Ai-jen Poo and artist and NDWA collaborator Marissa Moran John. Uh, we'll do more thorough introduction shortly, but first, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping and uh, an introduction to this program. So uh, today's program will be recorded. Uh, and it will be uploaded to YouTube and on uh, linked from our website. So if you want to watch it later or share it with anybody else, you will have the link to do that. Um, we always save time in our Let's Speak Easy conversation series to hear from you. It's really why we're here to connect with our audiences. So please don't hesitate to ask questions or offer ideas. You'll see that chat is enabled. And so that's where you can ask questions. That's where we'll put some links for you know further reference. But when we get to the Q&A portion, we would love for you to use the, the Q&A tool, which you should find at the bottom of your screen. That's where we will pull questions when um, when we get to um, audience q a part so um also i uh, should you want to use the live transcription tool that's enabled today as well so before we get to uh, the program if this is your introduction to monuments to movements uh, our, we are an international expansive organization that envisions develops and commissions public artwork that monumentalizes movement making and collective action Together we ask, what is possible when we create, imagine, work, fight, recognize, and thrive together? We offer a new vision and an evolving process that is not just inclusive of the world's diversity, but also paradigm shifting, feminist, and centered in restorative justice. Jane and I are a small staff of three joined by our wonderful colleague, Marcella Andrade, our operations strategist who is really involved with just about everything we do. Today, we're also joined by our wonderful Zoom tech colleague and artist, Kelsey Bogdan, who is behind the scenes for anything you should need. Beyond our small team, we are expansively growing. We have a group of movement builders that really extends through the whole world. You can learn more about them on our website. Um, they have directly impact the, the vision and the mission and carried it further of monuments to movements. And so many of our initiatives as, a, as an organization have grown from our partnerships with these, these movement builders, of course, of whom National Domestic Workers Alliance is, uh, is central to that group. So if this is your first introduction to Let's Speak Easy, it is our monthly conversation series that is really designed to connect to our current initiatives, the Monument to Human Infrastructure being one of these initiatives. And so each month we kind of dive a little bit deeper into one of these projects so that, you know, we can talk about our process publicly, we can hear from you, we can connect with you, we can grow the movement. If you missed January's Let's Speak Easy, uh, you can find that on YouTube. You can get the link from our website or from Instagram. The link is there as well. And that was with our wonderful partners, Urban Art Mapping Group in the Twin Cities. Together with them, we built uh, another Monuments to Movement initiative, our archive. And um, that is a a growing repository of, um, of projects that we and our colleagues have identified around the world that really meet the mission of, um, of monuments to movements and really kind of help elucidate what we're building together. And it's also where the projects that we build will be archived and analyzed and, and shared. Um, and so next month we'll be doing in March, uh, we'll be doing our next one, which is with um, 
which is on the, the topic of our, our feminist framework and our intersectional feminist framework in, in this group. And I'll talk about that at the very end. So um, you'll see links populating as I'm talking where you can hit our websites, NDWA's websites, our archive, and, and so on if you want to take a little bit deeper dive there. So I am in just a moment going to pass the mic to our colleagues and I would love to introduce them first. So uh, June Barrett is a longtime home care worker, a queer Jamaican immigrant and executive board member at Miami Workers Center and a leader in NDWA's We Dream in Black project. June has been active in speaking out about sexual assault and discrimination in the workplace, especially among care workers. June has spoken on an international platform around domestic work workers organizing and about the Me Too movement on a variety of television shows, including Full Frontal with Samantha B and BET's The Rundown with Robin Thede. As a Dorothy Bolden fellow, June has focused on base building in Florida, public speaking, and leading We Dream in Black programming for Black domestic workers throughout the U.S. We're also joined by Christina Mevs Apgar, who is the Culture Change Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance, where she leverages the power of culture to change perceptions and behaviors related to impacting domestic workers and the communities that comprise the sector, including women of color and immigrants. Christina develops opportunities to drive and amplify NDWA's culture change goals and strategies by coordinating the development of unique content, creative partnerships, and cultural organizing campaigns. Christina led NDWA's award with award-winning Roma Social Impact Campaign alongside participant. Christina has over 15 years of experience in the entertainment industry as an actress in 90210, Privileged, and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Before moving into the culture change field, she worked in communications and development at several domestic and international nonprofits. Christina was a regional field organizer with Organizing for America, President Obama's grassroots election team in 20. She is also on the coordinating committee of Storyline Partners, a collective of nonprofit organizations that collaborates with the entertainment industry to seed new narratives in television and film. Christina and June will go through a beautiful slideshow for us in just a moment, and they're going to discuss how and why NDWA locates art and culture at the work. So I'll pass it to you now, Christina and June. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We're so happy to be here. Um, so Christina Mevzapgar, she, her, thank you for the lovely introduction and we're so thrilled to be joining you all. Um, I thought I could situate us first on who the National Domestic Workers Alliance is, what we do in the culture change department. So I'll be speaking and then I'll pass it over to my lovely colleague, June. Can you put the next slide? So the National Domestic Workers Alliance represents the over 2 million domestic workers in the United States. Um, when I say domestic workers, who do I mean? I mean the women who do long-term home care for our seniors and loved ones with disabilities. I mean our house cleaners who take care of our homes and I mean our nannies who take care of some of the most precious individuals in our lives, which are our children. Um, these are largely women, women of color, many immigrants, um, many undocumented. Next slide. So the National Domestic Workers Alliance, our bread and butter is organizing. So we organize domestic workers, we organize with domestic workers, we center their leadership. Um, we are in community with over 200,000 domestic workers across the country. We're a national organization. We have over 70 affiliates, over, I think it's seven chapters now. Um, so that will always be our home as we organize to build power and win. But we believe that we need to um, execute multiple strategies if we're gonna, going to win the material conditions, um, changes that we need for domestic workers to thrive and their families to thrive. So we engage in policy change. We um, have launched uh, a National Domestic Worker Bill of Rights in Congress. We also have won many, many state-based Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. Um, we've been uh, campaigning for the last year 
to have a deep investment in our care infrastructure in uh, uh, the Build Back Better plan. So we definitely engage in policy. We also engage in civic engagement. So we have a robust um, program where we um, get people out to vote. We also do innovation. We um, have a product called Aaliyah, which is a portable benefits platform. We are always innovating how technology, how organizing gig workers on platforms um, can change conditions. And then importantly, which I'm gonna be talking about today, um, we believe that we need to change culture if we're gonna win. We believe that we need to create the cultural landscape that is conducive for domestic workers to win the material conditions that they need in their lives. Next slide. So I'm going to define what we mean when we talk about culture change strategy. So this definition comes from the Pop Culture Collaborative, which is an incredible institution led by Bridget Antoinette Evans, who is a culture change leader and strategist. So when we say culture change, we mean a strategy that uses long-term, multi-layered approach over time to use stories and other immersive narrative experiences to create profound shifts in how people think, feel, and behave in the world. Importantly to this conversation, it centers the work of artists, storytellers, media makers, and cultural influencers as agents of change. So every day we think about how can we use art and storytelling, how can we meet people where they are and create the narrative ecosystem that we need for our policies to win. Next slide. So I'm just gonna give a couple examples to illustrate what we mean when we say this is a strategy we employ. So um, Families Belong Together is a campaign that we um, anchored when forced family separation emerged um, from the Trump administration. Um, in addition to organizing over 700 events across the country in uh, 2018, we also engaged in art and storytelling to capitalize on the moment that we were in when the country was focused on our border and our dehumanizing and cruel immigration policies. Um, so we created a coloring book in partnership with our friends over at Anonymous Content um, and Elastic, which is an incredible company. We had graphic artists come together and build this beautiful coloring book called Coloring Without Borders. And the proceeds went to Families Belong Together. But importantly, this coloring book was um, jump-started conversations across the country with children and their parents about the concept of borders, about how we keep families together. Um, it was a lovely cultural product that we organized around and helped shift culture. Um, you can see below that image that um, we are lucky to partner with some incredible celebrity influencers who help um, bring our campaigns, our um, beliefs, our narratives into pop culture. Um, so you'll see right that there, um, uh, Alicia Keys and America Ferreira and Lin-Manuel Antonio and um, uh, Diane Guerrero. You will also see we were on stage in the top right corner. That's the artist Logic um, at the VMAs. He performed a cultural stunt um, at the VMAs and we had our workers on stage um, making a statement that families belong together. We also have a podcast called Sunstorm, which is co-hosted by Alicia Garza and Ijen Pu, where they talk about, talk to their uh, sheroes across the country about how women can live powerfully, even in this crazy climate that we've been living in. We also engage with film and TV and um, do social impact campaigns around it. Recently, we worked with Netflix's Made uh, to put on a panel and to talk to their talent and, and tell them how to talk about the real life conditions of domestic workers as they're publicizing the show. Next slide. Uh, leading into when we work with artists, which we are super, super proud of. So um, during the pandemic, um, where were people able to go? Well, they were able to be outside and they were able to um, see incredible murals where we were able to talk to um, individuals in their communities through art. So we did multiple different murals during that time period. Um, you'll see one above from Families Belong Together in Miami. 
Um, and then the two um, uh, yellow and blue murals um, are from our um, project in Atlanta, which is a major chapter for us, a major hub of organizing. Um, our heroine of our movement, Dorothy Bolden, who you'll see um, on the left, um, who organized domestic workers in the 60s and 70s um, in Atlanta, and is one of our, our, our great leaders in the movement. Um, uh, we have a beautiful mural of her in Atlanta, and then our Dear Domestic Workers Thank You mural. You'll see some of our member leaders posed in front of it. We're so grateful that we're able to work with um, some incredible muralists to really create the artwork that will inspire people to um, think about domestic workers and the value and dignity of their work. Next slide. So I am going to pass it over to my lovely colleague, June, to talk about Roma. Thank you so much, Christina. Once again, my name is June Barrett. Um, pronouns are they, them. So uh, Roma, so uh, yes, yeah, so, oh my God, Roma. So um, I remember getting a call from our, our uh, director from the Miami Worker Center, our ED, and she said, there's going to be a film premiering here in Miami. Um, but first, we got to talk about this film. So we went to a domestic workers meeting, and she explained the film um, to us. And um, and the day of the screening, we were there um, dressed in our finest to see this movie. And we were all hoping that it's not going to be another the help. It was going to be something different. We got to the theater, and um, at the beginning of this movie, we, we you know we realized that there was something different uh, about this movie. And during the movie, um, I must say that about 30 minutes into the movies, there was not a dry eye in that theater from domestic workers, because this film, it was real. For us, it was um, taking folks behind the closed door to see the complexity between uh, a domestic worker and uh, the families um, that they work for. And at that moment, we all felt as if we were clear. And, um, you know, after the movie, we went and we, you know, we, 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 we you know, we talk about the film and we, we all believe that this was the closest that any movie has ever come in terms of portraying a domestic worker. And, uh, we, uh, I, I was one of the, the domestic workers that was chosen to go to, to Hollywood um, to, um, to the Oscar, to the Oscar party for this movie. And it was a, one of the most beautiful moments, not just for me, but for the domestic workers. Because you see, for a long time, we were this invisible uh, workforce. We were, um, her work, as you know, is not valid. You know that the, the, the history of domestic work. And so for us to be there in person, to attend this Oscar party. And I remembered as we, we, we waited, we were at the Jane House, I never forgot that. And we waited and we waited. And I remember that moment when our film won that Oscar. I remember that very moment when I was there, we were partying, I was in my, my uh, tuxedo and the women, the domestic workers in their fine gowns. We, we felt like, you know, heroes and sheroes that even. And I remember uh, when uh, we were at the entrance when we heard that um, uh, Alfonso was coming in, Alfonso Caran was coming in and Ijen Poe. And I remember seeing him walking down. And I was at the side of the stairs. And as they walked down, I remember moving to in front of him. And I said, you changed my life. You changed my life. I could see the tears in the corner of his eyes as we say that and at that moment I held on to the Oscar and I moved into the Oscar and I, I, I and I kissed it it was one of the most uh beautiful moment I think uh, a beginning of change uh all the workers um that um was there that night, our lives have not been the same in terms of uh becoming uh more uh, vigilant in terms of you know or organizing in terms of the pride that pride hasn't left me you know uh that the fact that you know we were there we were visible 
and you know we, we we were told that the Jane House that that those tickets for the you know people heard the domestic workers were coming and those tickets were very hard to get. So that was one of the proudest um, a, a moment uh, for for me for us as a domestic worker as we get caught up in uh, you know this culture change. Yeah, and also you know being. Able to, to uh, you know, I was invited um, by the, the Latinx um, house at Sundance in 2019, where I sat on a panel with my colleague from um, Mexico, domestic worker organizer, and a representative for, from participant media. So um, once again, domestic workers, we are everywhere. Oh, may I add that I also get a chance to order and uh, the Oscar from the, the, the Green Book. They were at the Jane House that night. We were with Steven Spielberg sipping champagne. So domestic workers, and that happened because of culture change. So we're gonna move into time is up. So I tell you a little story uh, about that. Um, you know, we had a, a gathering of domestic workers, the first one ever in South Florida in 2016. Uh, our, our, the organizers uh, could not get a domestic worker. They, they, we knew, uh, we know that there's a really great problem here in South, uh, South Florida uh, with uh, sexual harassment and sexual violence, but the women were afraid to come forward. And, um, you know, they asked me, would you come forward with your story? Uh, I was in Jamaica in my hotel room when I got that call. And I said, listen, I can't answer the question, no, but I will. I thought about it. I said, no, uh, I'm going to come forward because maybe other domestic workers, you know, my colleagues who experienced that will come forward. And I did tell my stories. And the funny thing is that there, the media was present and nobody ran that story. They talk about the wage debt, they spoke about everything, but they, for some reason, they avoided the sexual harassment um, testimony that I, that I gave. And so um, I, I felt a little um, disappointed, but we had a women's circle and at the women's circle, women spoke about what they were experiencing. And um, I think it was that February, I was on a flight between Zurich, Switzerland and New York. I got a call saying, um, can you watch the TV at six o'clock? And I said, what's going on? So anyway, I got into Miami in time and I turned the TV on. Who did I see? Asian Poole and red carpet with Marilyn Street. And at that moment, um, of course, um, Tanara Burke was there, a colleague of mine from London was, was there, all activists. And at that moment, I started to cry. I felt as if, oh my God, oh my God, this is our moment. This is our moment to shine that light. And I took that moment. I took that moment and I ran with that moment and became you know, an advocate, uh, a spokesperson, un unapologetic, telling my story. And because of that, other domestic workers started coming forward and telling their stories around uh, Me Too. And of course, Monica Romanes, um, who penned that letter to Hollywood women and letter to a, 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 um, a, a domestic workers and farm workers women coming together collectively to, to me, to build one of the most powerful campaign I've ever been involved with called um, Unstoppable. So that was really a, a, a moment that, the, the, that we, we, the gate was open and we went through. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, both of you, Christina and June, that was, it, it, it was fantastic. And it just, I know, just parted the door open um, of what we're going to talk about. I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that actually guide M2M's work and, you know, why this collaboration is so important and why it's at the center of the movement that, that we really are starting. And we believe that art has a unique ability to deliver on the democratic promise. And the only thing that democracy promises is equitable participation. That's it. And that's also what art can do. Um, you know, come as you are. And that promise is dangerous. What if 
people actually participated and actually could participate, how different would the world be? And that's why art is dangerous, you know, in the best sense of the word. Um, we can all participate on our own terms and it's about access and equity. Um, that is what culture is about and that's what also movements are. And often art um, and social movements are working to transform systems of power, practices, narratives, values, and sites. And the M2M -M is really working against the reinforcement of, of interlocking structural inequality through art and movement collaborations. That's why these collaborations are really core to our vision. Um, you know, art by, with, and for public engagement and has really been at the center of all social revolutions and evolutions throughout history. And not merely as a tool for documentation saying, hey, this happened or indoctrination like join us or celebration or archives, but rather as an essential opportunity to make real what policy advocacy societies can't envision yet, but will really help them see the way. So it's coming. You know, art is ahead of the curve. It's often getting there before advocacy and policy and governments and by its nature, it is a leader. For example, inside the ongoing AIDS struggle, the queer liberation movement, anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, independent struggle in Nigeria and South America. Have we seen, you know, Me Too movement and the movement for Black Lives? All of these struggles employ and depend on art and culture as a central strategy and tool and have all been ahead of society and policy, each one of them has actually been the leader as long, along with culture. To really inherit in the artistic and social justice processes is the creation of reality before it is a reality. That's what we do. We make reality into being. Central to social justice work and creative endeavors is about imagining how the world could be different. We are not supporting necessarily what is already there. And art and culture need participation to be fully animated, to have oxygen and really evolve beyond our imaginations and create the kind of social shifts that we're talking about. We find all of this true for movements and for movement building. So some shifts we may never live inside, like physics, you know, we may be the velocity that pushes the structure, but we never inhabit the new arena. But it changes all of us from the inside and the outside, as you just heard June say. Um, June was really talking about how, she, how they were different each time they were part of these shifts, each time they changed personally, inside and outside. So together we're working to develop and implement new ideas and strategies for more, for more just, creative and collaborative world. That's actually what we're actually all doing together. I, I wanna just briefly introduce um, Ai-Jin Poo, who is the founder and executive director of National Domestic Workers Association and Marissa Moran Yan, who's an artist and an educator. They're going to share their ideas of the relationship between art and culture and movement building. Why art and culture is important to Aijin as a movement leader and why for Marissa, movements are important to her as a cultural creator. So without further delay, let's roll it. Hi, my name is Ai-Jen Poo, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. And we at NDWA have always understood the project of bringing dignity and respect to domestic work as both an organizing challenge and a cultural challenge. 
We believe that the project of changing the values, beliefs, norms, and feelings surrounding domestic work is a critical project in and of itself. It's a goal that we actually have to achieve in and of itself. And we've seen so many movements make progress on policy, but not actually invest in making the kinds of changes we need to make in our culture or our narrative environment and making our policy victories more vulnerable and making it hard to implement victories that we win. Leveraging the power of art and culture makes it possible for us to um, inspire and tap into the emotional lives of people and create transportive experiences where people can start to shift the way that they think and feel about uh, domestic work and the people who do it. It enables us to define not only what is factually true, but what is emotionally true for people. And artists, storytellers, culture makers are our trusted partners as we build towards a future where care and the women who do this work are truly valued and recognized for their humanity and their contributions. M2M honors, celebrates, invests in, and understands our collective actions to be our greatest accomplishments. And we're really proud to be imagining a transformative monument together in community um, as part of something larger than any one person, organization, or moment. My name is Marisa Moran John. I'm an artist working across sculpture, performance, film, uh, graphics and illustration, and public art. And I co design um, my works with new immigrants and working families. So my collaborators include street vendors, to migrant workers from Mexico who pick the, work, the food that we eat, to domestic workers, nannies, housekeepers, and caregivers. Uh, I also draw on my um, experience as a daughter of a Chinese uh, father and Ecuadorian mother who emigrated to the United States, as well as my experience as a working parent struggling to find care for my son, as well as keeping an eye towards the future when my parents, uh, who don't have a safety net, will need care themselves. Um, I have been collaborating with members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance since 2010. Uh, so that's 12 years now. And one of the things that continues to inspire me in um, our ongoing collaboration is uh, that care is something that everyone can relate to regardless of political or religious affiliation. Uh, we all enter the world with care. Uh, we will all need care during moments of illness and we will hopefully all end our lives with care. Um, so it's something that unifies us and is an opportunity to strengthen the socioeconomic justice of domestic workers and expand and strengthen the care options for the tens of millions of Americans who are struggling to find care for their family members. Um, and I'm interested in how art can be a tool for um, advancing change. And so I think that an initiative like Monuments to Movements is incredibly powerful and urgent and necessary because it's only through coming together and finding points of unity and strength that we can um, make real change take place. Um, and. Uh, when I think of movements, I think of times in my life when I've been afraid to speak out about an injustice that either happened to me or someone else. And what emboldens me is when I think about the women who uh, came before me and the women who will come after me um, and for whom I'm not only speaking for myself, I'm speaking for, um, uh, for a movement. Um, so I'm thrilled to be a part of this initiative. Thank you.
Okay, those were such an incredible contributions. Um, when I first saw them, watch these, and uh, and reflecting on it today, I just felt like um, both of them brought brought up such essential and powerful tools in movement building and culture change. And you know, one of them is it probably well, it is a Herculean feat to change policy, right? But then, as I Jen Poo is saying. Sometimes that's the first step, because after that, you still need to change hearts and minds. You need to affect culture. You need to make sure that people are connecting emotionally to those changes or else that movement becomes vulnerable. And then kind of intersecting with that is what, you know, something Mar Marissa John said, um, you know, movements are comprised of people who may not ever meet each other or be on the planet at the same time. You know, she's talking about you have to be conscious of the people that came before you, the people that come after you. You have to always be thinking about the past, present, and the future um, if you really want your, your work to succeed. And that's something we try to keep in mind in, in Monuments to Movements. We don't want to project our ideals into the future, but we want to be part of that change so that as progress comes, we're setting the groundwork, you know, kind of honoring the past but planting more of our own seeds so that we can strengthen the position of the movement builders in the future. Um, so uh, along those lines, I am going to kind of kick off our questions. And of course, if any of you want to uh, add anything about the videos, please do that as well. But um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and kick off. I'm gonna start with you, Christina. How can arts and culture be tools for movement building access and advocacy? You have you lead the culture change department in your organization and um, most advocacy and campaign organizations do not have this unit. So, um, you know, first question, you know, how can arts and culture be movement building tools? And at the same time, you know, what have you learned through this work that you wish everybody else knew and, um, and enacted? I think that what's most important is that um, there becomes some more acknowledgement that to build power, we need multiple strategies and that building narrative and building uh, collective will in culture is a power building strategy and that it's not either or between organizing policy, electoral organizing, like these are not choices we have to make that are either or. Um, we don't need to have a scarcity mindset where we're like, we have to go all in on one. There, there's many strategies that need to go in alignment together for us to win. Um, and that we can all work together to advance that forward. Um, and narrative and culture is a, is a field of practice in itself. Um, and that to be strategic and to win, we need to think in a longer time horizon. Culture shifts both quickly and very slowly. Um, I know in the current news cycle, we think, oh my God, it, it, culture moves so quickly. People have the attention span you know, of a, of a toddler and it just doesn't, it moves so quickly. But actually huge cultural shifts happen over time. And when we're in a, a campaign movement where a lot of advocacy is, very uh, tied to certain cycles and, and we only think in those moments. And I think too frequently narrative work and cultural work and art and storytelling gets put on the back burner because it has a slower time horizon or we try to place it within a rapid response or a campaign moment and fit it into there. Um, actually narrative and storytelling can be a long-term investment into uh, building power and winning. And along the way, you can it can provide wins in the short term, but really valuing the shifts in norms and behavior as a long-term goal, as a goal in itself, not just a goal to achieve the policy. Um, because as Ijen always says, you can win the policy and lose implementation because you have to have the cultural landscape to implement that. So I think for me, it would be most important that people um, just start to accept, believe in uh, the, the, that this work is important and, and, uh, and um, invest in this work. Um, and I think over the years, what I've learned is that um, you always have to innovate and you have to think big and you have to experiment and you have to take risks. A lot of the art and storytelling activations we've done 
Um, and we think of art and storytelling projects also as an opportunity to organize around. Um, that sometimes you're going to have tremendous success like we did with Roma and other times I won't list our failures, but you will have, you will have flops and that's okay. That's okay. I love that flops are part of the process, right? And, and, you know, it's true. You don't have to amplify those flops for the world. It's much more important that we learn from them because there's always something successful about every mistake, right? And you do need to, to honor that. I, I really love that point. Um, okay, June, I have a question for you really on the heels of this. Uh, what has your role been in the organization and in relationship to arts and culture? Um, and can you talk about an initiative you feel is important to illustrate your work in the, in the care economy? Okay, so, oh my God, I've, I've done uh, so many work, but um, the recent work that I've been, um, that I was involved with and still continue to be a part of that work is uh, a few weeks ago, um, we um, got involved, I got involved uh, with a project called Care Jam. 2021. And that was an initiative between Caring Across um, Generations, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, Code Coven, um, which is a gaming um, organization, and a whole bunch of dope people um, is, is a part of this project. And so they had, I think it was like a week of, uh, uh, I think the young people call it Akat where, you know, games from across um, the world came together and, you know, and you know, uh, develop uh, a game, our games, games, sorry, around care. So before I dig a little bit into um, uh, why Care Jam 2021, I'm gonna talk about the game that I was involved with. I was a um, sensitivity consultant and, um, you know, one of the, you know, the lead person in terms of the, the story um, part of the game. And our game um, is called Missing in Margate. And so um, we, well, my team had a hard time coming up, um, you know, with a storyline. So they reach out to me, uh, my team, uh, the lead of the team was based in London, and they reach out to me 5 a.m. in the morning. We are stuck, we need a storyline. I said, listen, let me give you a storyline. How about you? in a, a lived experience and we went after the lived experience about uh, this game missing in market and um i understand it's one of their favorite game from um from that so um so why why care um, and and why should we use um games to connect care and um the, the narrative that shape our culture values caregiving and care work the role of lived experience in shaping dominant narratives through games, how game can help us raise awareness and educate about the importance of care across the life uh, lifespan. And it's also a, a way to increase representation and visibility of a diverse caregiving experience within the game industry and the game storyline. And um, also, all games can challenge rather than um, perpetrate, perpetrate harmful stereotypes rooted in racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, xenophobia uh, that keep caregiving and care work visible and, uh, sorry, invisible and undervalued. And we also now know that the gaming industry is a multi-billion industry. And we also know that it's the younger generation, mostly the younger generation, who is um, buying and playing games. And what better um, audience um, to target? And um, the, the folks who were sitting at the table was uh, folks from uh, uh, a Media Alliance project, um, um, journalist and author of Labor of Love and Crisis in Care. We have, um, you know, uh, the, the New Brave World. We also have folks who um, were our head of a disability organization. And so uh, we had a young man who um, worked, uh, was a, a creative um, director and uh, Wakanda. So he was also sitting there. So it was a diverse um, group of folks um, that came together and said, listen, we should use game, you know, to bring awareness um, to, 
you know, to care. So that that's, you know, one of my favorite, one of many. But this one to me is very, very important because, you know, uh, we, you know, we were able to come together to strategize and say, listen, why not um, use game to bring attention to care and to the importance of care. Jane, you're muted. Thank you, June. That was really powerful. Not as powerful with the sound off, um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, it also just the way you're weaving in so many different things, right? Like going, you know, intersecting a system or a place people go anyway. I'm always talking about these drive-by cultural experiences. I've done a lot of stuff in public libraries because people are going there for other reasons and they just come up against some kind of cultural uh, moment that impacts them in a way that they weren't inspecting, expecting. And so I think like with, you know, games that are really about change, that's a really important aspect of it. So I just, I wanna get right to um, the, the collaboration that we're embarking on and really talking about why we need uh, a monument to human infrastructure in public space. And, you know, how will this impact communities, movement building, you know, how will it impact the care economy? And I thought, June, maybe you could kick that off. Um, and then Christina, if you wanted to add in briefly. And then we're getting some great questions from the audience too. Yes, um, let me start by saying that, um, uh, you know, domestic workers are some of the most marginalized um, group of um, people. Um, we are uh, a, a very invisible workforce. And the reason for that is that we work behind closed doors. And behind uh, those clo closed doors, it's just us and our employers. We do not have a HR, we do not have a middleman. It's just us. And so that's why it's very, very important, you know, for us to, to get involved with organizations like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, our local af affiliates, and get really get involved to fight and to create the visibility that we are seeking, the respect that we are seeking because as you know, um, our work is not valued. Um, you know, as you know, um, we, we do not get the respect and we, uh, we all know that that's because uh, we carry on uh, the plantation um, mentality with, this, with domestic work. Uh, domestic work, as you know, it's a, a, a legacy that is deeply uh, rooted in slavery. And so that's why we, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, along with our affiliates, is working so very hard to uh, create um, the change through culture change, so we can have that respect and the, the, the uh, uh, visibility that we need. And I'm going to go back and touch on the mural, uh, the first mural that was done here in Miami. and. Um, domestic workers, there were domestic workers who cry in the women's circle, because we have a women's circle, because they are seeing themselves saying that, listen, this is us. We are important. People are beginning to talk about us. The mural, uh, I did not get a chance to, to see the Dear Domestic Workers mural in Atlanta in person, but I remember the effect that it had. Uh, this last um, uh, set of work that was done, I decided to go to Atlanta on my own not through the National Domestic Workers Alliance. I wanted to see it. And uh, luckily for me, I, I was able to meet the, the three artists uh, that was involved in this project. And I went along with um, the, the other Dorothy Bolden fellow, a close friends, a couple of us. It was one of the most moving experience, right? to see um, the story about uh, Dorothy Bowling, to see this powerful woman, right? A lot of people in the community that we met said, we are living in Atlanta, we have never heard about this woman. And uh, um, so, you know, she became even more visible through these murals. And for me, it was deeply moving. It was so deeply moving to see her, the work that she did, she was uh, a part of the civil rights movement, working with Mother Lou 
for the kids, it? but yet no one knew of her. But because of this girl, everyone in that particular community knew of, and beyond knew about um, Dorothy Bowling. So that is why I 100% I um, support the work that the National Domestic Workers is, uh, Alliance is doing along with its affiliates to create visibility through culture change, through arts. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, Christina, did you want to answer that question as well? And it was um, going yeah. back to why why we need a monument. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think the thing is, um, domestic work has always, um, whether it's paid or unpaid, been a private issue. It's in the home, like June said. There there is no um, aggregator by the water cooler. There's no HR. It's a one to one relationship. It is unregulated. Um, but it is also hidden. Um, so we talk about domestic work being invisible and in the shadows and in isolation and NDWA in general considers itself a home of and for domestic workers to build power together, to um, create a, a, another family um, that is organizing together, um, processing together. Um, and so putting that that work and and the struggle and the triumphs into the public sphere is really important and monuments and um uh murals and um dance parties and uh cookouts <laughs> and you know some of our chapters do incredible things outside like putting those um experiences in the public sphere um, and take making, you know, I mean, the feminist movement has said for a long time, making the personal public, making, you know, moving those issues, domestic work as a labor issue is inherently that it is making um, this personal, you know, domestic workers are part of your family known as a labor relationship, as well as a very intimate, you know, can be lovely relationship between clients and domestic workers, making it public. Uh, and that sort of visibility for workers, for the public um, is important in itself. That's such an important point um, because it already is, you know, um, I mean, that's why we really called it human infrastructure, right? There is nothing that actually can be held up without it, right? And then yet it's invisible. So how can something so that so permeates our life, our culture, our world, yet be so, you know, invisible. So I think that um, it's, a, you know, it brings up that kind of issue is like, what do we choose to see and what do we choose not to see? Um, there is a question um, about, um, you know, is there a worker story you'd like to bring attention to today? And there were questions a lot about Roma, but I think really people want to know specifically how it shifted power. Um, and I think maybe a, a, an easy way to talk about that is just the system of the Oscars and, you know, again, putting it in public in front of everybody, something they come to anyway to watch the Oscars and then there you are. But can you talk a little bit about a worker story that you'd like to bring attention to? Um, today that has people understand um, what you're talking about and why these narrative shifts are so important? I think I'm going to pass it to June because we do have an exciting initiative um, that we also uh, are really proud of called the Pop Culture Worker Council. Um, that June is a leading facilitator and a convener and organizer of that space. Um, and it is um, a, an intentional effort for us to make sure our culture change and narrative change strategies are centering worker voices and that we build pop culture literacy, um, just like you would any sort of media literacy for our workers to really understand popular culture, how it functions, what the mechanisms are and how we can make interventions to make sure that their stories are reflected, not just in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of what is the priority, what are the stories we want to tell, not only what is true, but what do we want 
to be amplified. Um, and so we're a couple months into that program and it's going to be continuing to build um, in June. So I'm just wanting you, if you have any reflections on that and, and if, if anything has surfaced, I know we had an interesting panel last night, if anything surfaced with individual stories. Yeah, so you wanted to dig in, in a little bit into the culture council, Christina? Yeah, so um, so the ND, NDAA culture change team, uh, they launched a pop council council um, for We Dream in Black and, um, you know, and the affiliate organizing organization member. Uh, uh, for different sectors of domestic work, house cleaners, nannies, caregivers, also, um, you know, t storytellers, artists, and creative entrepreneurs. Okay, so um, from September, we started this um, in September, um, along with um, our colleague, uh, who is lead, uh, the lead facilitator, um, uh, Karina, and the Shaquille Williams, who is um, the other Dorothy Bolden Fellow. And this and this pop culture council, our members will work together to think through how to use, create, and develop stories and other um, immersive narrative experience to spark profound shifts, right? In how people think, feel, and behave um, in the world. So, um, we have 15 um, cohort members uh, from diverse um, language um, background. We have Asian Creole, Nepali, Spanish, uh, and English. And as I said, with representation from the, the different sectors of the, the domestic um, work industries. Um, a lot of people don't know that, yeah, there are different sectors. Yeah, there are house cleaners, nanny, and myself, care workers and the, the members are based uh, you know across the, the, the country for example in North Carolina Houston uh, the Rio Grande Valley um, border with Mexico of course New York New Jersey Philadelphia Miami Seattle uh, etc etc Atlanta Georgia so by the end of the fellowship um, as member leaders you know they will be able to strengthen their ability to analyze and critique. And you should hear them last night ripping the maid apart. It was such an intense time last night to listen to that. It was so, such a, a, a powerful moment uh, to create and to imagine narratives, media and culture outputs that ensure our knowledge and live experience of domestic workers, right? Um, that we are included in every stage of, um, you know, our culture change strategies, right? Um, I'm going to run through some of the topics that we'll be covering, and uh, topics like you know introduction to narrative power and storytelling uh, around our heart and culture uh, have always been a part of domestic worker organizing. Uh, analysts of uh, the on-screen uh, history of domestic workers, example TV, film, and gaming. Analysts of culture change um, campaigns, focus and film, uh, working with artists and creating lived experience, social media influencers, and how to become one with generative opportunities to create right the story that we would like to see interwoven. So that is what um, uh, the pop culture is all about. And um, I should also mention that. Um, we also get a chance um, to sit and in writer's room. So that's how big uh, mm. our culture change program is. Uh, I get a chance to be um, on cherry picks. And I don't know if you all know what cherry picks is at cherry chat and who they are. And um, so we, I get a chance to be in cherry chat. And that is a cherry chat really, really try to, um, to, to, um, to have representation of the female non-binary critical voices in this, uh, culture change um, culture. And so um, NDAA at that table, we're a part of that. Yes. 
What an uh, incredible note for us to end this program on. Thank you so much. That was really exciting to hear about the work you're doing. Um, I just and just have to say um, your energy brings so much to this work and our today's program, June and Christina, uh, same for you. Um, you're, you really brought this knowledge and expertise to this collaboration. I, I know I can speak for Jane in saying we're just so grateful and honored to have you as, as part of our work with Monuments to Movement and in, the, in this conversation today. So thank you so very much. Um, and to everybody that joined us, thank you as well. Um, we're, we're doing this to expand our network and build our movement. And we're glad that you showed up with us today. Um, and before we sign off, I just want to announce next month, uh, same place, same time, uh, Tuesday, noon central time, March 8th, we have our next Let's Speak Easy. So very much building on this topic, which is in, in, the next one is intersectional feminist frameworks with our friends and colleagues, Michelle Duster and Melissa Potter, where we'll talk about how feminism lays the groundwork for all of the work we do in social engagement, community engagement, art making and movement building. So please join us there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Yeah, bye.